It's amazing the people we have here, isn't it? Absolutely amazing. Um, Michael D. Cohn is a, a whistleblowing attorney, a partner in Cohn, Cohn and Calapinto. And since 1985, Mr. Cohn has successfully represented numerous high profile uh, retaliation and QTAM cases in, um, in, in several cases. He is going to introduce the next uh, speaker, and I think you will be blown away. Michael, you stately whistleblowing attorney, you. <laughs> If I may, could we have Linda Tripp please come up here and stand? All right. All right. As you know, my name is Michael Cohn, and I am the proud co founder of the National Whistleblower Center, along with my brother Stephen and my law partner, Dave Colapinto. In 1988, the National Whistleblower Center became the first national organization to use the word whistleblower in its title. Back then, people had no understanding of what that term meant. So we wanted to define what it meant for us and for anyone who came to our organization. And that definition began, begins, a whistleblower is someone whose loyalty is to the truth. The truth can't pick a side. It's neither Democrat nor Republican, and it's most certainly not beholden to the powerful. I guess it was some 20 years ago that one particular whistleblower asked us for help. She was in real trouble. She'd been removed from federal service, her reputation destroyed, a criminal indictment was looming over her head, and the walls of post-traumatic stress were closing in. That whistleblower was Linda Tripp. My first introduction to Linda Tripp came on the TV screen. Some extremely unflattering images appeared again and again and again. It was always the same image. And I got a very uncomfortable feeling in the way the whistleblower was continuously being presented. I didn't know anyone involved in that endeavor, and I left it at that, something that just bothered me until she came into my law office and seeking help. At that point, I was free to ask her any question I wanted answered, and I wanted to find out the answers of why that video image bothered me so much. And I wanted to really find out whether she had loyalty to the truth. Before anyone ever knew her name, Before anyone ever knew her name, Linda Tripp was ostracized. Government officials entered into her privacy areas that were supposed to be protected by law, and they released it to destroy her reputation before anyone knew her name. We pursued those Privacy Act violations on her behalf, and we forced the government to admit to having intentionally violated the Privacy Act. Linda Tripp helped cement a cornerstone of our democracy, that even the President of the United States is not above the law. Her story is timely and important, and it is time that the larger whistleblower community has an opportunity to hear from her. Thank you. Um, normally, a root canal would be preferable to speaking publicly. Uh, I tend to not do it. 
Um, I wanted to say that my daughter Allison is with us today. Um, absolutely unwavering support, and I'll never forget that. And her eldest daughter, one of our seven grandchildren, with us as well. So welcome. I think my five granddaughters out of the seven um, would benefit from hearing this one day. They're too little now. You're almost there. Um, look, we've heard uh, today amazing stories. It always really blows my mind. But a whistleblower armed with the truth wields enormous pressure on wrongdoers, on folks who... Um, believe that they have a way to do whatever it is they want to do. doesn't matter whether it's civilian, military. It's enormous power that we bring to the table. And over time, we've forged a path leading to much greater accountability in industry, in politics, justice, and a more safe and honest world. But it all comes at an enormous price for the whistleblower. We're different. We're compelled to act. There comes a point when it's no longer a choice. Um, and despite the hardships and the personal pain, not only to us, but to our families, when asked, most of us say we would do it all again. You know, in my case, had the circumstances been similar um, and had the sitting incumbent been a Republican, I would have acted no differently at all. It was simply at its core about left and right. It was never, or rather, it was always about right and left. No, 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 <laughs> wrong. Right and wrong, never left or right. And I will say that this became so polarizing um, globally, really, with everyone having an opinion, uh, and yet at its core it had nothing to do with politics, um, which is hard for anyone to understand had, if they remembered the story uh, many years ago. But what it was about was exposing perjury and obstruction of justice. Um, it just simply was never about politics. Um, we talk a lot about whistleblower protections, and I think enhanced protections are long overdue. For instance, I believe that all of us as whistleblowers um, will not be fully protected until those who actively perpetrate the retaliation are individually, personally held accountable. And I know you all in your own walks of life and in your own experiences know what I'm saying. Uh, it's not just the company or the agency that needs to be held accountable. Um, but it should be the individual, one who does the bidding of those um, in higher positions. If there is no pain on a personal level to those uh, individuals, then there's no t deterrence for those that fo uh, excuse me, follow. And I think all of us sitting in this room can identify with this statement. Too few of us are ever made whole again. It is virtually impossible to get your good name back. The vitriol, the attacks, the slander remain in the public domain and sort of color people's thoughts forevermore. I'm not sure they ever really dissipate, regardless of what you say or how loudly you say it. We must do better. I know what it's like to be in the crosshairs of the most powerful person in the world, to be attacked viciously, not because I said something untrue, but because I said something people did not want to hear. And it was about a popular president. You know, to politicians, only sides matter, and the truth becomes the casualty. 
I think we're all a bit different. Whistleblowers believe that truth is not disposable, not dispensable. Integrity and honor mean something. And to those who see us as betrayers, if we're seen through a lens of negativity, then my question to them is, if I'm not a team player, whose team? Whose team? You know, in my case, my duty, we, Steve talked about duty, my oath was to the office of the presidency, to the institution, not to the sitting incumbent. And I was true to that oath. I told the truth. But I do fault myself for not having the gumption or the courage to do it sooner. I was faced with a culture of corruption, and again, this is not partisan in any way, that was infecting the office of the presidency. I, I was quiet for many years. I was afraid on many levels to speak up. There was a quote, and I will give you that quote. Open quote, we will just have to destroy them. End quote. I first heard these startling words in the West Wing of the White House. They were chilling. They were not directed at me. But in early 1998, I began to fully comprehend what the politics of personal destruction really, really means. And you know, they say forewarned is forearmed. So I knew what was coming, but I was ill prepared for the power and the fury and in the end, the overwhelming effectiveness of the smear campaign what had seemed abstract to me, we'll just have to destroy them, was now personal, and I was the, the target. I know what a real high-tech uh, high lynching feels like. I felt like that's exactly what happened. It began with the smoke and mirrors you saw on your TV, where it turned a sitting president into a victim of a vast conspiracy. It was the full frontal attack on anyone who would dare speak against him, the de destruction of another human being, and the besmirchment, belittling, and ridiculing for political gain. When the villain is magically victimized, which is essentially what happened, the wrongdoer became um, the victim, that's when, in my case, the whistleblower was essentially destroyed through all these allegations and the ridicule and humiliation that I suffered at the hands of a complicit media, um, a, certainly a willing entertainment in, industry. So it was, it was not pleasant. And it was very unpleasant for my family. And for that, I'll always be sorry. You know, there are two things that I think we got out of today with um, a lot of the speakers, actually. We all end up sharing a couple of things. First, uh, I don't even know how to, to quantify this, but it's a feeling of sheer loneliness. Um, a feeling of an utter sense of isolation until you meet them. But um, a feeling that you're on your own and that no one really is on your side. Um, there's nothing quite like it, and there's nothing that can prepare you for it. But then comes the second phase, and I think we all face this on some level. The retaliation the retribution, the personal and the professional attacks. When you speak truth to power, the powerful push back. When this story broke, 
the 24-hour uh, news cycle was in its infancy. Back then, it was normal news uh, at normal times of day, and there was just so much they could fit in. However, that changed. Um, my story was tailor-made for this very thing. And for me, it was the birth of advocacy journalism. It was a time when reporting took a back seat to uh, opinion journalism and slant. Uh, and it was all filtered, most importantly, through a um, political lens. So while I was watching this, as everyone else was, um, I was pretty stunned at the portrayal. Um, it colored the national dialogue. It formed national opinion based on very little fact at all. And in my opinion, victimized the wrong person. I hope that my being here today can help change that dynamic, even if just a little bit, um, so that whistleblowers, future whistleblowers with just causes can avoid the harsh reality I faced. I blew the whistle on not just a powerful person, but the most powerful person in the world. It was not until I became aware that the president was informed that I, quote, knew everything, that I decided to act. To this day, I regret that I didn't do so sooner. But when, in July of 97, that I became aware of what he knew, I threw caution to the winds and accepted that my career, my livelihood, my pension, and by then I think it had spanned a good 26, seven years, federal civil service, uh, I knew all of it would be a casualty of, of the action I was going to take. And to those out there who say I did this for personal gain, I say, standing here 20 years later, what did I stand to gain then or now? I stood to lose everything, and in fact, I did. And yet, if I had to do it all over again, I would. Uh, I will say I simply couldn't have lived with myself had I failed to act. It was poorly done. Uh, you know, there was no handbook, there was no manual that said this is how you take on a sitting president as a lowly civil servant. Um, but had I done things that might have been better for me in terms of gathering evidence, like taking contemporary, uh, contemporaneous notes, uh, documenting evidence two years before I finally did the catch-up to recreate uh, on celluloid what I had been hearing in a horrifying fashion for two years. Had I done all that, um, perhaps the end result would have been different. It might have been the removal of a president from office. Uh, and again, what I provided to the independent council was insufficient. Uh, had I had the proof that I should have had, the result would have been different. You know, a woman I once knew quite well famously said, it takes a village. <laughs> I couldn't have navigated the shark-infested waters whistleblowers face without the passion, dedication, determination, and brilliance of my incredible attorneys who are here, right here. The three co-founders of the National Whistleblower Center, Steve Cohn, these are important names, Steve Cohn, Michael Cohn, and David Colapinto. Thank you so much for all that you do. They broke the mold with these visionaries, and we are all better for it. Thank you.
That was incredibly powerful. I thank you, Linda. That was amazing. And thank, uh, thank her family for standing by her because... <laughs> I remember a special agent in charge who said to me when I was blowing the whistle, and I, he did not want me to continue forward with it, and he said, you have a kit of your own to think about. And I knew that was a threat. And I know that Linda had to be thinking of you when she made some of the decisions she did, and that takes incredible courage. Thank you, Linda Tripp, for your courage. I would like, uh, real quickly, because we're going to wind it up, I would like, uh, real quickly, for you to meet my daughter, Victoria Turner, who... survived while I was out in the desert. I would like to thank Stephen Cohn, founder of NWC, Michael Cohn, Dave Calapinto, also Mary Jane Wilmoth, the Chief Operating Officer and Secretary Treasurer of NWC. I give a nod to her mother, Kay. Thank you for a wonderful daughter. Together, these four amazing attorneys have over 100 years serving for whistleblowers. That's amazing. I also want to thank Julia Mellick and Maya Ifretti. They put this together. They did a wonderful job. And the whole crew of the National Whistleblower Center staff and interns I, don't, I, I want the whistleblowers to remember to network and to take care of yourself physically, emotionally. And I want to see you next year, and I want to hear how you are controlling your narrative. Thank you. Have a great year. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much.